and I'd like to introduce Melanie Smith. Now, Melanie has a background in education, health promotion, counselling and fitness, and she joined the physical activity movement in 1980 and has never left. She's authored more than 50 health promotion and physical education programs and resources and papers, and she is now the CEO of Active Ageing Australia. Please welcome Melanie. technology problem. So you can see at the centre of actively ageing, it's keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. All of those things, whether it's connecting with others, lifelong learning, having a sense of community, all the things we've heard so far this morning are all connected through movement. The first thing you want to do as a child is to be independent, move, walk. The last thing we want to do is give up our independence. So moving through life is our call to action, but the word keep at the front. So keep moving for life no matter what age you are. What I'd like to do very briefly is to talk about the journey that we've been on this year, 12 months looking at literature, looking at what's happening around the world, and I've come to the realisation that we don't have the solution. It's not our role as the peak group. Our role is to disrupt challenge, question, work with you. Some of the things that we've found around the world are really exciting, but one of the key themes is that it's about just what Peter said. It's about context is everything. And no matter how good a program might be, a strategy might be, culture, whether it be the culture of the club, the gym, the organisation, the system, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so active ageing is full of stereotypes. Vive la revolution. I hope I said that right. And um, again this morning we've seen a common theme about revolution. There's a technology revolution. There's an industrial revolution of a different kind. So at the moment we're also seeing a revolution with the way we work with our communities. So I'm not talking about specific things for older people necessarily, but it's a life course approach. So, as you rightly said, Peter, and I wanted to put a picture up of silos, I'm glad I didn't, but I find, as a translator across different sectors, different organisations, there are silos. We need a whole approach, a portfolio, with all government departments work towards this, with all organisations doing their bit. A siloed approach will keep us doing what we've always been doing. Viva la revolution and be part of it. I am as a baby boomer. So population ageing is actually a triumph. People are living longer. We now know of people who go to 100th birthday parties quite commonly. Pretty soon it'll be 105, 110. So it's been one of the best things that our society has managed and it's through technology. We're living longer, we're living better in some ways. Maybe we're disconnected. But it's also one of the greatest challenges. 
And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new when you know that if you see it as a deficit model, there's a big problem. You can hear it in the news all the time. You can hear about changing retirement age, the cost of older people. There are so many stereotypes. Fundamentally, there is an economic imperative, an economic driver, because we cannot afford to keep populations ageing well and at home unless the systems change. But reframe that into a positive. It's not a deficit model, it's a strengths model. Older people, the community, we have the solutions to these issues. So it's one of the greatest challenges, but also the greatest opportunities. Economic drivers are there, and one of the biggest drivers that I've had 20 months in this role now, and I've learnt more about recreation sport than I did in 30 years in SA Health because I see it from a different perspective now. But one of the greatest challenges for me is nobody comes knocking on my door. It's kind of, can we work with you? Can we work with you? I went to a meeting and there were so many people around the table, day two of the job. And we were talking about trying to, they were talking about trying to get more kids involved in sport and rec. I asked the dumb question. Well, have you thought about keeping people in sport as they get older? Nobody answered me. I thought, dumb question, Mel. Three phone calls after that meeting, I thought, oh, well, I've triggered something here. It's not about instead of working with different populations groups, it's a whole life course approach. So there are lots of revolutionary things we need to do. So this is the same pitch. Put your organisation's name underneath here. The same pitch I just gave to the Federal Minister of Aged Care, who gets this issue. There has never been a better time or a more urgent need to put active ageing principles at the centre of, put your word there, aged care, which is not calling aged care, it's calling living communities now. Recreation, sport, health, community, local government. This is a revolutionary time. Because active ageing is not our word, we are just really fortunate this organisation predates the term our organisation was born around physical activity, which is, to me, the central tenet of keeping you independent at home for as long as you want to be independent. But it actually is a WHO initiative, 2005. I think they've changed it to active ageing, and it's about whole health. It's interconnected. We are our experiences. We all want to stay well and at home for as long as possible. So there is a revolution happening in living communities, aged care. There is a revolution happening in health. But I don't see the revolution in sport. I don't see it yet. But we have aged care sectors who are desperately looking for more interesting things to do. Part of my job is to concierge, ACH, ECH whatever organisation you think of. Have you thought about working with recreation and sport? There are silos in way people think. But if you have driven around, seen any TV adverts, know the North American and the rest of the world's model, because this is happening around the world, you will see, perhaps a good example is the Glenelg Football Club. There's a gym down the bottom of Glenelg Football Club. It's an ACH gym. Watch out good lives. I work at Good Life, so I can say that. Watch out the fitness sector, because you need to look over your shoulder. You've got a whole industry who are going to do it better, do it inclusively, and are looking at what older people need. Older, by the way, the definition of WHO is when you've reached midway through your life and the country of which you were born. So in Australia, it's actually 45. We don't put a number on it because it's about capacity, it's about experience, it's about capability, and it's also about attitude. So, why do we need to change in sport, and certainly recreation, and a lot of other areas too? Because we've got outmoded paradigms, there's a whole lot of stereotypes around us all the time, and I remember one of our life members who started this said, for goodness sake, there's got to be more than playing bowls and bingo, or cards. Yes, there is. And look at the women's movement in sport. And I was fortunate to hear the SNFL speak and had a beautiful slide of the young girl, the preteen, the teenager, the young woman. Where is the older woman playing sport? This cohort will change everything.
But if we just look at the discriminatory language, images and cultural practices, they are everywhere. We need to join up our systems. We need to not think in silos. If you can capture new markets with people who want this stuff, I'm a boomer. Anyone that was born between 46 and 64 is a boomer. I hate the term. But the boomer is, boomer is the population bulge. There is no denying this. You'll make most money if you look at this uh, area. Most members. We need a new workforce. I call it the wellbeing workforce that can cut across different systems, different organisations. And, you know, being a bit disruptive, I've had conversations with people who say, but there's masters. Well, excuse me, I think the word implies mastery, something I have to be good at to even do. I know that's not the culture of masters, but that's the impression of masters. Can't do it now, I never did it when I was young. But there's a whole lot of stuff that has to happen that's more than masters. This is the bulge, just to show you quickly. In 1911, the number of older people, you can see the wedge gets smaller. Look at the big fat wedge by 2051. And it's the people who were born post-war to 64. And it continues. So challenges, issues, opportunities. And as a 60-year-old, I don't expect to be able to be sitting in a seat doing exercises. And what amazes me is I work a lot with aged care groups. We have programs. I think we should get out of program land. We should be strategic and, and helping people to make change, not necessarily offer the programs. But we do. We do lots of workforce development. One of the things I notice, we've got this great program. We train leaders of the future. They are in operating in aged care centres and you get people walk to the program and then they sit down in a chair and do this program. So it just seems ridiculous that people don't even think about uh, the culture. So I don't even remember the worldwide numbers, it's billions. So the fastest growing ageing population is actually in Asia, the rest of the world. And of course you can see the link with technology, use of technology to help people reconnect. In an animation, by the way, which was a literature review about the benefits and what is active ageing, a literature review of the papers synthesised to paragraphs, the paragraphs synthesised to sentences, the synthesise of that was to a verb. So that is all evidence-based and hopefully it's the first evidence to animation that we can do. But look at the numbers, a quarter of us, and I was talking to Abby, if you don't know Abby, Abby's from RSB. And just one of the implications is that one in four people will have a sight deficit. That's got implications. That will have implications for infrastructure, for buildings that are being built, for club rooms, where you need to have contrast of colour so that people can find their way more easily. It's not a 90-year-old. There is a big difference between a 60-year-old with function and capacity, an 80-year-old with function and capacity, a 45-year-old person who's managing many chronic conditions. Most people now have at least three, maybe even five chronic conditions. Where does allied health and sport medicine meet sport? I used to play tennis, but I can't anymore because of my dicky shoulder. Give it up. No, there's got to be something in between. Where is the coaching for older adult course? You can do coaching for children. Without pathologising it, I do a lot of work with physios and allied health, but there's a lot of pathology about, oh no, you have to teach people how to do it properly. Well, for goodness sake, I sit on the toilet and I get up. You cannot pathologise a squat. You don't have to teach me how to do a squat. So it's been hijacked, this area of, oh, you need to talk to your allied health specialist. It's the third tier out, the fourth tier out in community. In health, you might get five visits with your package, your aged care package, or your health care package, five visits with an exercise physiology, and then it's by, you might go out to country, you're back to the farm, no group class, no support structure, but who is there? Community, sport. It's about linking those together. So we hope to work with you on those areas. So we've got the highest life expectancy, one in three, as we've heard already this morning. And the majority of people actually do live at home. And that is the economic driver. We cannot afford to look after everybody. So we want people to have, you can bend the ageing curve. It doesn't have to curve down. You don't have to long life of sickness. You can keep it. You've seen the TV programs that show that you can have an ageing curve like this 
and then maybe a quick death at home. That's the way I want to go. So only one in four live over 85 live in accommodation. So there's a stereotype about who ageing people are. Well, we're all ageing right now. So living longer, living better. Uh, that's the name of the Federal Minister for Aged Care's package. And we all want to stay home. Now, in aged care, as in disability, the package now goes with the individual. I get the choice. Do I want this or do I want that? Do I want like that? So the drivers for me will be working, if you've ever known a relative who needs to go on the May Aged Care portal, it is so confusing. And it's been written by the system, not for the people, with the people. So if you looked on that and you tried to find something that might be enablement, you know, who's providing quality physical activity or sport programs? You can't find it. You might find an allied health or an exercise physiologist and it's all again pathologised. But my dream is that one of the levers for change could be any of the providers for my aged care, and you can see them pop up all the time, Uber care, this care, that care, and in fact the whole sum of the aged care industry, um, give up the gardening, no thanks, don't give up the gardening, keep doing those things. So maybe you want someone who can help you participate to concierge you to your physical activity, to your sport program, et cetera, et cetera. There's some wonderful partnerships, ACH we worked with last year. I think there were some early adopters, some innovators, and this will change everything. We just need a few good examples, but we don't have the answer. We can facilitate the processes. So we know why physical activity, you know all of this. So remember there's the health sector looking at this work too. And in my career in government, liaising back into rec and sport or education or with health or with local government at times, I've seen that it was recreation and sport and health, two different creatures. But over those 35 so years, then we meshed, be active, etc., etc. It's a wonderful relationship, then it moves apart, then it moves together. There is no question that this has to merge again because it's all connected with the health and longevity and well-being of our community. So we know that it's the, if you could change one behaviour, it's actually physical activity. So this is a revolution. We know all of this, but you probably maybe don't know about the brain connections. And when I listened to Jordan this morning, I know there's some amazing thing going on with virtual reality and dementia, um, reminding people. There's a question I have. The connection with nature is huge for our well-being. But if you can't get out for any reason, do you think a virtual experience of nature will actually have some well-being effects. I don't know, but a great research project that would be. Um, muscle mass. I think something else has been hijacked, and I'm hoping to, with revolutions, you have to have somebody at the front, or a group of people at the front to get the tipping point. Whether it be a revolution around industry or a revolution about a social issue, gay marriage, whatever, somebody has to say, shout, 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 shout. So we need more people leading the force and shouting. Because one of the biggest things with um, the physical activity recommendations, for those of you who know that, can you remember what the physical activity recommendations are? Has it, has it worked over the last 15, 20 years? Do you remember the number? How many minutes should we do? 30 minutes a day, which equates to 150. So the 150 message, we've done a really good job of telling people what and maybe why. We still haven't converted people to the how. Do you know there's a second recommendation? Most people don't. It's been hijacked by the cardiovascular agenda. Because you've got to die, and I come from the Heart Foundation as well, so I can be disruptive. You've got to die of something, and I think for many of the deaths it might say heart failure, heart failure. It actually might skew the data with cause of death. You know the biggest, the biggest impost on the community is musculoskeletal conditions. Look at the funding between cancer, heart, musculoskeletal. Who knows the second recommendations? You should do strength three times a week. Strength and dementia. It's muscle mass. You can actually put it in the bank. And it's also balance. But a lot of people don't get that. And ageing, you should know that your balance deteriorates from your 30s. So mobility and strength actually equals ability. 
But ageing takes place in community, in the context of people's lives, family, friends, workplaces, neighbourhoods and communities. So, but the problem is people are lonely, as the Federal Minister said. I'll, t I'll skip on some of it. Do you like our posters? These are some of the posters that we developed from the literature, what active ageing is. But it's about intergenerational. So I would love to work with groups who want to do something with kids through to older adult. So it's not isolating kids. It's not isolating older adults. That's something we've learned from this journey. Uh, yesterday's child is today's adult and tomorrow's grandparent. They're actually on the bouncy castle. And these posters have been very popular because it is about ageless play. If you lose the sense of play, probably lost the sense of fun. In our organisation, we're only tiny, but our mantra is think big, have fun, get mm, done. <laughs> so that's what we're, and are we having fun today? And there's always get stuff. Um, but we know sport and recreation, you know all of this, so I won't go over that. One in three Australians say they've experienced discrimination. Maybe you have, I reckon I have. This comes from a person that was interviewed especially for middle-aged and older women, you're invisible. And I just use an example in the community of the old birthday card. This is just an example of the endemic nature of the way we think or we joke about ageing. Aren't they horrible? But that is kind of invisible, but it's more explicit in other ways. And this quote says that they, they're often assumed to be based on a truth and the humour kind of counteracts the negativity. We need to challenge every kind of stereotype. And there's also the extreme stereotype. 90-year-old lifts weights. 100-year-old runs marathon. It's kind of like, oh, no, that's a bit weird. So we haven't got any real stereotype, enough critical mass of real people doing real things as they age. As I said, I work in a gym, I teach classes. I'm not represented on the posters. If you would like to work with what makes an age-friendly experience, I don't even like the word ageing, that's why our, our name is, no, our call to action is moving for life. No word ageing in there. Moving for life. But if you'd like to work with this on what are the principles of an all-age-friendly experience, what does it look like in the culture, the way the staff operate, all of those systems, we'd love to work with you. There we go, old paradigms. Stereotypes can become self-fulfilling. These are some of the reasons why people we've worked with or as some of our members have told us, you know, this stereotype, it's time to put your feet up now. You've worked hard for this retirement age. This is still prevalent. Not interested anymore. Old dogs, new tricks. And I think this one, we're going to work on this one, we're very interested to work with you on this, is about how can you help people find the right sport for their condition, their chronic condition, their body. You know, there's got to be something for everybody. Maybe it's not rotational sports with this injury, but maybe we could find you and help concierge you into the right place. And then when you get there, it needs to be a welcoming culture. We did have one program a few years ago, which was the wrong thing to do. It's basically a, a come and try for $10, five sessions. Actually, I think it widened the gap because at the end of that 10 sessions, well, here's your membership fees. Sorry, can't get there, can't afford that. It was actually the wrong way to go. So we've learnt more about what not to do. There's no one answer. But we know that you actually need to intervene much earlier. As I said, the second phase of life not suddenly assume that an 80-year-old wants to play table tennis, but it's about having a life course approach. I love this. Sport England are doing some amazing things. One thing I'd like, to, perhaps we can do this with inclusive sport, is a portal of decent photos so you don't have to go to eye stock and get the stereotypical, beautiful, uh, older person. An uh, eye stock bank of photos that we can all use to help change the culture. Love this one, there's a whole lot more. Sport England are doing some amazing things. Canada are doing some amazing things. New Zealand, and I'll finish on that in a moment. New Zealand, I think, are the closest to what we're doing and we can learn a lot from the New Zealand approach. It's about physical literacy. Physical literacy doesn't stop when you're seven. It's not about developing fundamental skills in school. It, you can always learn something new. But it's not about shifting the provision of funding or services away from kids. 
It's all of it. Intergenerational. So maybe even the words active aging aren't right. Increased opportunities. It's a different way of thinking, and we don't have the answers. I just wanted to talk to you about it. But we know we've got a big problem because less than half are involved in physical activity. That's the guideline. And only 40% of that half say it's sport. So we're not capturing the economic market, but it's about connecting with others. It's about maintaining your connections, being there. And we've heard that theme come through. Lifelong learning, we've talked about that. Physical literacy. It is about motivation, competence at any stage of life. Don't make assumptions. We actually almost used this, I'm finishing on these points, as our poster at the top, and we didn't know whether it was just a bit too out there yet, the gentleman. We haven't used him yet, but that notion of maybe it is humour. Ah, oh, there's that word customers. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll change that, communities. Uh, what is it? But it's a conversation. So if you'd like to have a conversation with us, we'd love to have a conversation with you to find out what people need. But the key themes that we had from the literature review around the world, these were the key themes. So if you're going to promote it, talk about making new connections, whether that's be brain connections, pathways, or social. Having a sense of freedom, a sense of joy and discovery, new identities and possibilities, giving back, contributing, there's nothing new in here, passion, nostalgia, and a sense of I've come, I've arrived, destination, now I can do what I always wanted to do. So if you think about the way you might promote that to your community, there's some lessons in that as well. Make sure people have the opportunity to link in, fit in, take part, and that sense of destination. If you'd like to know more about what we found out over the last year, I would love to listen to you and to have a conversation. As I said, I think we've had this hijacked. There is there's some 10 principles that Sport England are working on. And if you'd like access to this, I can give you the notes. But to finish, I think we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So keep on playing, keep on moving, and really the ball's in your court. Come and see me. Thank you.